Welcome to Truth Corps. Well, as if it wasn't confronting enough for the entire nation to be greeted with images of Prime Minister Anthony Albanese gleefully shaking hands with mass murderer and genocidal maniac Xi Jinping over all over front pages and television screens. As if that wasn't confronting enough, we've also been confronted with the news that we're up to pay billions of dollars in climate reparations to this ridiculous two trillion dollar fund that has been set up over at cop 27 that his moron climate change minister chris bowen agreed to sign up to also they could have a bid for the next cop 27 which is in 2026 so these guys are a bunch of social climbing elitists who don't care about the people of this country. So we've signed up to a economically suicidal a fund that will destroy us financially and destroy us industrially. We have signed up to this. He has agreed to be part of this ridiculous globalist socialist wealth transfer from the west the western countries to so-called developing nations including the communist party of china who are still listed as a developing nation but for somehow have the world's biggest navy at the same time and build more cold fouled power stations every day compared to the rest of the world they're like the world's second biggest omitter of pollution or something probably the number one now so it doesn't even make any sense what's going on here it says here in the daily mail anthony albanese has accused peter dutton of dog whistling to racist voters by complaining about australia's paying poor countries for climate change damage loss How's it racist to bring up the fact that you're throwing away our money towards a corrupt global globalist scam that is going to damage this country and take hard-earned dollars out of the, the hands of the taxpayers that could be going to support the people of this nation? How is that racist? How is that racist? It's your job to look after the interests of the people of this country, not globalist interests and the interests of other countries it's corruption the opposition leader began question time on monday by asking doesn't charity begin at home regarding the two trillion dollar the two trillion dollar international fund australia signed up to the loss and damage climate fund at the cop 27 summit in egypt on sunday along with other rich nations well is australia really a rich nation that's, that could be debated because it is true that Australia has a lot of natural resources, but this does not translate into cheap energy prices as the bulk of it is shipped overseas to power foreign nations like the People's Republic of China. Power prices have risen by 20% this year and are tipped to rise another 30% in the coming months with no relief in sight. Inflation is sky high and rising with a 7.3% rise this year as the highest inflation rate since 1990. Rent, gas, petrol, electricity and, and cost of living is rising and our living standards are lowering as a result. There's uh, Every day in Australia we have... There's more than 278,000 Australians that sought help from specialist homelessness services in 2020 and 2021. And any given night, there's 116,000 Australians officially classified as homeless. So that's got to be much, much higher than that too. There's hundreds of thousands of Australians out there homeless, sleeping in cars, uh, they're living or they're living in dwellings that are inadequate. Uh, these are families most of the time. They are... Uh, these are people whose families have broken up. The most vulnerable Australians maybe have mental health issues, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of poverty in this country. 13.4% of Australia is living below the poverty line. We have 
one in eight adults and one in six children living below the poverty line. That's 3.3 million people or 13.4% of Australians. That's, that is pr a pretty stark reminder, that statistic there, that we are not a rich country. So, also, when you look at the, our manufacturing base is decimated because of globalism, because of globalist policies. We no longer have a manufacturing industry in this country. We are not a first world economy anymore. We, uh, most of our jobs are like service level jobs and stuff like that. It's, it's not, um, there's no job security anymore either. So calling us a rich nation that should now be uh, paying reparations to the rest of the world, to so-called developing nations, nations like China that can afford to spend billions, trillions on their defense so they can invade Taiwan, that we should be paying billions of dollars to countries like that? I don't think so. Especially when China has a population of 1.412 billion. Just look at the rest of the world compared to Australia, not just them, okay? Let's have a look at the rest of the world compared to Australia. Australia has a population of 25 million with low birth rates, below rep replacement levels, approximately 1.7 babies born per woman, but it can be as low as 1.58 recently. But replacement level is 2.1 babies per woman. That's half of what it was at its peak in 1961. So, exactly how low do our birth rates have to be to please these eco-fascists as well? Yeah, because they, they want us to depopulate as well. Australia is a tiny pop country on a huge amount of land with a very small population compared to the rest of the world. Most continents the size of Australia have huge populations, like Africa, that has close to a billion people. And booming birth rates. If you look at Africa, the average birth rate is 4.2 per woman. The highest birth rates in the world are found in the sub-Saharan Africa. Niger tops the list with a birth rate of 6.8 per woman, followed by Somalia at 6. So, yep, Europe has 746.4 million people living it. That is a continent, just like Australia. Southeast Asia, 684 million South America, 422 million. Central America, 184 million. The Middle East, 476 million people. India as a country, 1.4 billion almost. Pakistan, 225 million. Bangladesh, 166.3 million. China, 1.14 billion. Australia, only 25 million. We're only... 0.33% of the world's population and only do 1.2% of world emissions. And that's probably inflated by climate change alarmists who have an agenda. So, so are we a rich country? We are a small country on a lot of, on a big amount of land. We don't emit that much stuff. We don't even have a rich population they're attacking the middle class and most of the wealth is disappearing from this country at an astonishing rate. So we can't afford to do this, Mr. Albanese. We can't afford to be throwing money away to so-called developing nations that are amassing armies against us. We can't afford to be paying reparations to these people. So this is a ridiculous treasonous move by Albanese and we are not a rich nation the people's living standards are slipping in this country the fund will help developing countries deal with the effects of climate change such as natural disasters rising sea levels really rising sea levels it takes uh, like a hundred years and that it's hardly even gone up in the last hundred years but details are still to be hammered out. Yes, they're going to hammer us over the head until we pay them. Don't we already help nations who experience natural disasters anyway? When the uh, the Asian the tsunami happened, we helped out our neighbor Indonesia, and anytime something bad happens to them or anyone in the region and almost anyone in the world, we will come to their aid. We we have a, a big fine um we have a big foreign aid 
system going. So, no, this is an absolute joke. We help. We we do a lot of charity out there. Mr. Dutton argued Australian tax dollars should be spent in Australia instead of being used for what was essentially foreign aid. This is a global communist takeover. This is a social socialist wealth distribution that is going on in the world here. This is nothing but worldwide communism. This and communism always ends in depopulation, death, and genocide. There will be a global die off when these people are finished. Mark my words. At a time when Labor's policies are driving up cost of living pressures for families, the government has just signed up to funding two trillion dollar loss and damage climate fund which will send money overseas and beyond our region, he said. Prime Minister, doesn't charity begin at home when you will start helping Australian families instead of giving away their money? That's right. When are you going to start helping all those homeless Australian families? There's a lot that he could do. Here's some statistics on poverty in this country. We have the 16th highest poverty rate out of the 34 wealthiest countries in the OECD. Higher than the average for the OECD, higher than the UK, Germany, and New Zealand. There you go. We got a higher homeless rate than New Zealand, or a higher poverty rate than New Zealand. That's because of the high prices for everything here. People are struggling in this country, and jobs are going overseas. Our poverty, our 2022 poverty in Australia snapshot. This is from uh, povertyandequality.org found that there are 3.3 million people, 13.4%, living below the poverty line, a 50% medium in, median income, including 761,000 children. So there's 761,000 children living in poverty. What happened to what Bob Hawke said in the early 90s about no Australian child will be living in poverty? Look how far the Labor Party has fallen. And he was a globalist too, but look how far they've fallen in their aspirations for the people of this country. They've become a party of globalists and traitors. The report further found that one in eight adults and one in six children are living in poverty. Many of those affected are living in deep poverty. The average poverty gap, the difference between the incomes of people in poverty in various types of families and the poverty line, is $304 per week. The poverty rate soared to 14.6 in the March quarter of 2020 due to COVID-19 restrictions. But it fell to 12%, a 17-year low, in the June quarter of 2020 due to boosted income support payments. Yeah, there you go. So... This money could be going to welfare payments rising. I know a lot of people don't like the idea of that. but the th- And that's something that could be debated in Parliament. But that's something would be a better spending of our money than, s- than sending it over to some globalist slush fund where it's all going to get swallowed up by these, uh, these uh, non-government organisations and these corrupt dictators and countries. Okay, so they could be doing that. The boosted payments brought 646,000 people, or 2.6% of all people, out of poverty. That's quite a statistic, and that was something that the Liberal government had to do at the time. Uh, Remember that they were trying to get also all the homeless people off the streets because of COVID. They were putting them up in hotels and stuff and turning old motels into like homeless shelters and they became like drug dens and yeah it was um it was a pretty grimy situation but they did deal with the situation better than say they're probably doing now uh but yeah see there's a lot of homelessness out there there's a lot of vulnerable people in australia and this climate slush fund that they're they're signing on to that forgets about them doesn't it that that they're getting this money is not going their way. We could be looking after our own, just like Peter Dutton is saying here. The child poverty rate rose from 16.2% in the September of t- quarter 2019 to 19% in the March quarter. Okay. So child poverty is on the rise and things wouldn't be getting any better right now. Who is affected most by poverty? 
Most people believe living below the poverty line in Australia rely on social social security for their income. Our second 2020 report, Poverty in Australia 2020 Part 2, who is affected, found that the majority, 56% of people below the poverty line are renting, while only 17% of people in poverty are homeowners who don't have a mortgage. In fact, the main factor determining the poverty status of older people is their housing status. 41% of renters aged 65 and over are in poverty compared with just 10% of all people aged 65 and over. So housing crisis, that's something else this money could be going to. Uh, the rental prices are going up. Most people are s spend more than half of their money just keeping a roof over their head. Then you've got the rising gas, petrol, uh, just rising costs of everything, even just registration for your car, everything. We all know how it's going up. And what are they doing? The inflation's going up at this time that they've done this. Inflation's going up to record levels. It's the highest inflation since 1990 right now. So, this housing crisis, it is the, the defining factor in sending Australians into poverty. They could be doing something about this. They could be creating affordable housing, but instead this money is going over to so-called developing nations. People with paid employment are also living in poverty in Australia. Among people in households where their main income is wages, 7% are in poverty. So even people working in this country are in poverty. 7% of people with a job are in poverty. Among different family types, sole parent families have the highest poverty rates at 35%. Children in sole parent families with a poverty rate of 44% are more than three times as likely to live in poverty as children in coupled families who have a poverty rate of 13%. Well, yeah, there we go. The breakup of the family unit. That's been something that these socialists have been working out for a long time. These feminists and basically just these people who are anti-family out there, that they are destroying this country, sending families into poverty and doing untold damage to this nation and to the children of this nation. And the government could be throwing some money the way of those needy families. But no, it's going to these developing countries for the, this bogus climate change agenda that doesn't even really exist. They've just been pushing fear on the population, especially in schools, to young people, making them afraid of the sky, yeah? telling them that the planet's heating up, that the ice caps are melting, when there's no evidence to support that. It's just a bunch of bogus scientists, once again, pushing propaganda with an agenda, pushing fear, and you know whenever they're pushing fear on you through the media, you're being manipulated because they know that when people are in fear, they do not make sound decisions. They make deci decisions based on emotion, and they are manipulating those emotions to get a desired outcome. It's called mind control. It's called social engineering. So, this is ridiculous. And they don't care about the people of this country, especially those who are the most vulnerable. And this is proving it. These are supposed to be labor policies as well. But here we have Peter Dutton pointing them out to him. Mr. Albanese, back to the article, said the question was offensive and a tactic by the coalition to dog whistle to racist voters. Yeah, I still don't get that. I know what dog whistling is, but I don't get how it's dog whistling to racist voters to point that out. And I find it offensive that he used that to deflect the question. The idea that any foreign aid is giving Australians money to foreigners ahead of Australian interests the leader of the opposition knows better and he knows exactly what he's doing with that question, he said. The only people who are pleased about that question are the people sitting in the corner up there because they represent seats that have been rejected, that have rejected that sort of dog whistling tactic from the Liberal Party. The people sitting in the corner were teal independents who snatched safe Liberal seats at the election by combining pro-business policy with progressive social policy and support for climate action. Yes, uh, the Teal candidates. They are evidence of our rigged system, rigged by big business, rigged by special interests. These Teal candidates play a 
big role in bringing about the New World Order plans in this country and the corporate plans for big business and uh, these climate change bogus agendas because what they do is with our rigged system, with our compulsory voting system and uh, preference preferencing system they have, that basically knowing how many voters are going to turn up when these teals can get their hands on these safe liberal seats and make they become kingmakers basically they give preferences to the labor party and keep these socialists in power so they can continue continue doing the bidding of the world economic forum i'm not saying that the liberal party's good or anything because they're in on all this stuff but the teal candidates they're backed by miners uh, people who used to be in mining that are now getting into wind farms it's all a big corrupt scam and the system's rigged. The Climate Loss and Damage Fund was the main aim of developing nations heading into the COP27 summit last week. The US and EU have long resisted the idea of paying for damage they caused through historical carbon emissions, fearing massive legal claims. Well, where's the actual, where's the actual evidence of any of this? I don't see any evidence of it. I'm not going to believe a bunch of scientists that have an agenda that get paid by government by governments and globalists to come up with data or else they get fired that backs their agenda because we know they've got an agenda here however both relaxed their position as week as the week went on when it was agreed it would be a fund they contributed to not the threat of direct claims. Almost all the details are still to be worked out, including exactly who will be eligible, who will pay, and what kinds of disasters would be compensated. The US and EU also want China, which, though listed as a developing country, which is a joke, but the UN has the world's second largest economy and pumps massive amounts of CO2 into the air to pay as well. China initially won't be required to, but the possibility of it and other big emitters like India contributing will be discussed later. Well, yeah, I just brought that up, didn't I? They've got a massive population. They're massive polluters. Australia emits hardly anything, and we have a tiny population on a massive amount of land. They should be giving us money. But in reality, no one should be even having anything to do with this. Pacific Islands Forum General Secretary Henry Puna, a former Prime Minister of the Cook Islands, told COP27 delegates the climate crisis is our daily reality. On loss and damage, we cannot wait for the next COP to see action. We are experiencing loss and damage now and delaying tactics are not acceptable, he said on Wednesday. Yes, well, of course they're going to be beating that drum because this is like... It's like giving a drug addict his fix. They're going to be addicted to these payments now and this money and they're going to be they're going to be hooping and hollering. They're going to be carrying on about climate change now and expecting us to just keep paying. Climate change minister Chris Bowen said before the deal was struck that it was too soon to commit Australian funds to the loss and damage mechanism. Mr Bowen has made much of Australia's support to ensure the loss and damage issue was on the COP27 agenda, but consistently said this year's summit was never meant to talk about who would pay for what. That, he said, was an issue for down the track. You're asking me how we will respond to a facility which does not yet exist and which has not been agreed to at this COP yet, he said on Friday. Australia quickly committed to the fund as soon as it was agreed to, two days later, but its level of contribution is still an open question. Yeah, so it's probably a lot of this is just a total waste of time, possibly. Let's hope uh, this kind of madness at least opens up the possibility that we may w withdraw from all these treaties in the future because this is totally not in our interests. It's totally not even our job to pay for this because we are a tiny emitter, even if you believe in this stuff. So, no, we shouldn't be paying a cent to this corrupt globalist slush fund.
and the madness continues with this article here. UN rights body rules Australia failed to protect from climate change. The United Nations Human Rights Committee on September 23 found that the Australian government had violated the rights of Indigenous Torres Strait Islanders by failing to adequately adequately protect them against the adverse impacts of climate change. I think that's the last thing that the government's done to them, to be honest. There's plenty of worse things that they've done to Indigenous people on the Torres Strait Islands and here than this. The groundbreaking decision of the committee an independent expert body that monitors state compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and P Political Rights establishes, establishes important protections under the International Human Rights Law for climate-affected communities. The complaint was the first legal action brought by climate vulnerable inhabitants of low-lying islands against the state. So they're saying that like the, the tides are rising and that it's the fault of us mainlanders. Eight Australian nationals and their children, indigenous inhabitants of the Torres Strait region, alleged that Australia failed to implement an adaptation program to ensure the long-term habit habitability of the islands. So they're saying they're sinking under rising sea levels. Okay. The committee heard that changes in weather patterns harmed the islanders' livelihoods, okay? Culture and traditional way of life. Well, if your culture can't survive um, some rains, some, you know, wild weather or whatever, which your, your culture, I'm sure, has put up with over thousands and thousands of years, this sounds like a bogus claim to me. That's all I'm saying. So it's survived worse things before than this. Yeah, they're saying that the world's ending because of rising sea levels. I don't believe that this is a that this is an honest claim. Severe flooding caused by tidal surges destroyed family graves, while heavy rainfall and storms degraded the land and reduced the amount of food available from traditional fishing and farming. I still don't see how that's the fault of Australia, that that's gone on. That's just a bit of bad luck from the sound of it. Continuing on. The community found that despite construction of some seawalls on the islands, the Australian government had not taken sufficient steps to protect the islanders' homes and livelihoods. The committee also found that the government had not provided the islanders with a way to maintain their traditional way of life and transmit their culture to their children. Well, what exactly do they mean by that? Like, isn't that up to you to maintain your traditional way of life and transmit your culture to your children? Or are they saying that the white man coming to this region and establishing a colony had disrupted their way of life? I don't understand how climate change has caused this and how it is the fault of mainland Australia. I just don't get it. It sounds like another Marxist tactic of wealth distribution using this Marxist agenda, globalist agenda of climate change as a way to suck funds out of what was once a functioning, a functioning economy. States that fail to protect individuals under their jurisdiction from the adverse effects of climate change may be violating their human rights under international law. Well, where were these guys when we were all having our human rights violated during the pandemic? Where were they then? They didn't give it, they didn't care, did they, about human rights then? Under the op optional protocol to the ICCPR, states that an obligation to provide those whose rights have been violated with an effective remedy. The committee ruled Australia should pay adequate compensation to the claimants and secure the community's continued safe existence on the island. Okay. The Human Rights Committee decision paves the way for further legal action and compensation claims by other climate-affected communities around the globe. So yeah, they can expect now that we're going to get blamed for everything, especially when we're going fronting up to COP27, uh, 
saying that we're guilty and need to pay the world climate reparations when we're only 25 million people on a huge land mass and we only put out what is i would say would be an inflated figure of 1.2 percent of emissions we are only 0.33 of a percent of the world's population so we're not guilty of any of this stuff this is ridiculous this is wealth transfer it, this is global socialism under the new world order also we've we've joined this global methane pledge to we're we're pledging to stop our agricultural output by 30 percent in the next seven years that's going to drive up food prices and start a food shortage uh yeah none of this makes sense this is all just economic and national suicide we are sacrificing ourselves and our children's future for the new world order and the new world order is satanic in nature it is nothing but a satanic death cult this is what the world was like before christ came before christ came on the scene people out there were scared of the gods that they worshipped they feared them they would worship sun gods moon gods multiple pagan gods and they feared them they feared crossing them they feared what the environment would do to them every day of their lives they were they would pray for harvest they would pray for rain and sun and pray to keep away earthquakes all kinds of things they feared the gods and that's what this climate change cult is it's the return of the old pagan religions and there will be a sacrifice when this all culminates the depopulation agenda is just a sacrifice to their pagan gods that they haven't gone anywhere they've just resurfaced under this globalist agenda for the new world order which is in nature satanic